Quick and no. Oh, now we're live. Holy crap. Hello, everyone. This is Dwight Hurst joining you again for another DBT Skills Workshop. This is workshop number two. In case you're keeping track, there are only two so far, so it's not that hard to keep track. In a couple of weeks, there'll be more. It'll be exponentially more difficult. Today, we're going to be talking about the specific DBT skill of that is called accepts. That's accept, plural. Not acceptance, that's a different thing. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, as I said before, workshop number one, of course, is the introduction to dialectical behavioral therapy skills. These workshops offered on YouTube are meant to be supplemental to your therapy process. If you are already engaged in DBT work or are unable to find or afford or find DBT work, whatever, this is meant to be a self-help kind of a guide to help you learn those skills. This online workshop in no way represents psychotherapy or a psychotherapy relationship between me and you. Uh, that should go without saying, but I'm just making sure you know that if you watch this, you are not necessarily my patient. Uh, although my patients are uh, glad to have you watching just like everybody else. So if you'd like to learn more about this project of these free DBT skills workshops, please go to dwighthurst.com slash groups. That is, oops, there you go. That is my name, dwighthurst.com slash groups. You go to that web page and you learn all about this kind of process that we're doing. So, as I told you before, we are talking about distress tolerant. DBT is separated into many different ways to help us to resist our overwhelming emotional impulses that can often be damaging and or self-destructive. Distress tolerance being the first one that we are uh, focusing on, the first section. I think it's the most important section to start with because if you can't tolerate distress, you can't tolerate much. Distress, of course, is the psychological term for what we usually mean when we say stress. Some stress is good, stress from exercise or stress from something that you enjoy or are passionate about. You can get stressed out about a project and still be really into it and it can still be a healthy thing. Distress, meaning bad stress, is the kind of thing that you have when you are overwhelmed or as we say in DBT, flooded with emotion. When you're flooded with emotion, you may make bad decisions. Some of those decisions may even be self-harming. Suicidal thoughts, uh, self-harming in the form of cutting, burning, things like that could be part of that. But they also can do with a, a other impulsive decision-making where you decide to steal, to lie, to end a relationship, to end a job, to do certain things just because you're in a state of distress that you might not do otherwise. So distress tolerance skills, to reiterate from last week, are not designed to solve the deeper problem. What they are designed to do is to help you to survive until you can do something different. Many times these boil down to distracting yourself away from the current level of stress until you can calm down. And that's what this one is all about. Important difference between what we are talking about and the skill of acceptance is this. Acceptance is a psychological term that is used in, more often in behavioral therapy where people will focus on telling themselves over and over again to accept their situation for what it is. That is not what we are talking about today exactly, although that is a part of the DBT process. We are talking about the acronym ACCEPTS. See that? That's a different thing. DBT loves acronyms. DBT itself is an acronym for crying out loud. It stands for Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. So we're going to be going through the word accepts and talk about what it stands for. So that being said, remember, all of these techniques that are contained in the skill of accepts are going to be things that will help us to distract ourselves from distress so that we can tolerate it. That's the mission of distress tolerance. A. A stands for activities. Activities are one way to tolerate our distress. Uh, so th this is pretty simple one. Activities are simply finding out something to do, preferably something that is healthy, definitely something that is not unhealthy, uh, that we can do that will help us to tolerate distress. 
and survive until we are more calm. Uh, the activity can be anything. Uh, well, some of the best activities are things that we can find to do that are healthy in nature. It could be exercise, it could be gardening, it could be uh, going and having a drink, a soft drink, or a hard drink, that's up to you. It's basically doing something that is a meaningful activity that is not harmful or unhealthy for you. That's going to depend on the person. Like I said before, uh, you might say, I'm going to go drink a soda. You might say, I'm going to go have a beer. If you're an alcoholic or otherwise inclined to not drink, then drinking a beer is not one of the activities that's going to help you to tolerate the stress. It will actually cause stress. So you have to kind of weigh that out. What you're trying to do is you're trying to force yourself to distract your mind away from whatever it is you're distressed about to some activity. And this is actually where you can get rather uh, uh, flippant and shallow and silly about this if you want to. I know many people who will utilize Netflix or one of those kinds of things because that is an activity. Binge watching a program, it is an activity. Now, you have to be careful, as I just said, if you have an addictive or other type of compulsive nature uh, or a compulsive kind of problem or an addiction to a certain activity, you need to be a bit careful because doing an activity to distress, uh, to tolerate distress, is not magic. It doesn't mean that the activity, if it is harmful for you, will not lead to more stress in the long run. So you have to know yourself Keep in mind that distress tolerance, we're talking about a very narrow window of time. When you are in a state of distress, that might last for a minute, it might last for an hour, it could even last for an afternoon, a whole day. But if you're in an acute state of distress where you are likely to actually do something harmful to yourself, that is going to be a shorter period of time. So if I watch a movie, that is good. If I watch uh, six series of shows, over a period of three days, you know, that's probably not the activity that's going to be the best for me. However, I will say this, if the alternative is self-harm, then I'd rather binge watch a show all day. I'd rather that you binge watch a show all day as well. And so you have that's where you have to measure out the activities. What is going to be useful to you? A lot of times it's really good if you can find things that you are passionate about. A lot of people in find writing to be helpful or reading or other other kind of pursuits like that. You can do too much of those things as well, of course, but that's what you do with activities. C, the first C in the accept skill stands for contribution or contributing, however you want to spell that word like I just did. Contributing is actually a way to tolerate distress. When you find yourself in a state of high stress, what you want to do is you want to think about, is there anything that I can do that will contribute? Uh, ideally, that will contribute to another person, society in general, some kind of a cause or something. It can be anything on the scale of like really important to not nah, really that important. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the ways to contribute is to look around and see, is there anybody that I can help that is available to me? I can go and help them, then that would be it. Do I have a neighbor who, whose uh, lawn needs to be mowed? Do I have a friend who needs a ride somewhere? Do I have any kind of a church or civic organization that I'm involved with that I can volunteer to do some service? Or to visit someone who is uh, perhaps elderly or perhaps infirm? Could I go to a nursing home and volunteer and do something there? Could I go there and just visit? Anything that I can do to contribute. Uh, now, sometimes this runs right into the distress. If you happen to have social anxiety as part of your distress, then you want to factor that in uh, to this idea of contributing. Are there ways to contribute where you don't have to interact with people? If you can interact with people, of course, that's very healthy. But if you find that you are extremely stressed out, I would still encourage you, or extremely socially anxious when you're stressed out, I would still encourage you to look for opportunities to contribute. One example is a person that I worked with years ago who they were extremely socially anxious and so uh, they would find ways to help around their neighborhood. They, they had a cemetery just down the street from where they lived and they would actually go there and look around and see which graves did not have flowers on them or which graves were not well tended as far as little weeds that come up that, that maybe the cemetery attendants or technicians or whatever you call somebody who works at a cemetery 
uh, we're not, you know, beyond their scope of just regular maintenance. We all have maybe seen these when you visit a family grave, little weeds you go and pull out and wash off the, the headstone and things. Um, and this individual would go in and would actually, in some cases, slightly decorate with flowers, but usually tend to and care for uh, graves that just seem to have been forgotten. And this was their way of contributing and reaching out. Um, they would also find some ways to do some anonymous things. Um, I've also known several people who have written thank you notes and have brought those to people who would not expect them. Maybe people that they knew, they just say, hey, thank you for being a good neighbor. Um, maybe they would even drop them by. I, I actually knew someone once who, who dropped them by gas stations in the area. They would write a, a, just a meaningful little thank you note that said, hey, I really appreciate you being here. You know, none of us would get to work if you weren't there. And, you know, you should know that what you do is important. Little things like that. And if you get clever about it, you might be able to find some things that, that you can contribute. One of the things that happens when we are depressed or when we're flooded with emotion, is we often feel badly about ourselves and contributing can actually uh, contribute to us feeling less that way. There's another C, by the way. You might have noticed that accept has two Cs in it. If you did, congratulations, which is a third C that's not part of this. Okay, this one's actually a little controversial. Look at that. See that? Oh, I separated those so you can see them better. That's We're just doing this live on the fly, people. Comparison. Uh, comparison is an interesting coping skill. Uh, so let me tell you what it means, and then you can uh, disagree with it. Uh, a lot of people do. A lot of people like to fight with this one. Comparison is finding a way to compare your situation with other people's situations. And here's the way it's designed in the DBT manuals. What you do is you look around for someone who's got it worse off than you, and then you go and say, well, at least I don't have it as bad off as them. Now, I can already sense and hear all of you out there who aren't watching this live, but you're doing it in the future, so that's kind of time travel, guys. Anyway, I can already hear your objections because I hear this one all the time whoa, doesn't that just make me some kind of a jerk if I'm just comparing myself to other people and saying, ha-ha, suckers? Uh, maybe, and maybe you don't like comparison for that reason. This brings up an interesting point, which is that since DBT is based off of skills, you're going to find that out of the 19 skills and all of the sub-skills within the skills of, of the DBT world, not all of them are going to work for all people. Nobody's come up with a system yet that is going to qualify for that. So... It's fine if comparison doesn't work for you, just skip it. But I'll tell you a couple things I've noticed that help comparison to be a bit more meaningful. If I am to compare myself to others in a worse situation and say, well, at least I have it better than they do, uh, sometimes that can help. Another way to compare is to look at someone who's in a worse situation and say, oh, I feel some empathy for them. That might help. That would be a comfort to some people, not to others. Another thing is to compare yourself to people who maybe you're in a different situation that's not necessarily better or worse. And to say, hey, I guess everybody has a hard time. Um, I had a, a patient that I used to work with years ago who would always say to me, you know, through much suffering comes much compassion. Uh, we get better at compassion. I don't, I don't know if they invented that statement or ripped it off from somewhere, but I ripped it off from them, so there you go. Uh, at least we can gain compassion when we're going through suffering. So sometimes if you look at somebody and say, well, you know, hey, they're also suffering, so am I. We're all in this thing together. We are all, after all, fellow passengers to the grave together, as I think some character in a Charles Dickens book said once, or something. So that's a long statement that you can try to use to comfort yourself. That's one another way to do comparison. Um, that can also tie in with contributions that you can make as well uh, because sometimes you can volunteer and you can see how some people actually not only maybe have a little worse than you do, but they also uh, need you. If you go and volunteer at that nursing home that I mentioned earlier, maybe you're needed there and that can actually help you to feel good as well. One thing I'll say about uh, comparisons to be careful about is you do not want it to turn into a guilt trip everybody has the right to be upset about whatever they're upset about. And if you look in the newspaper and say, oh, well, there was a, there was a tsunami over here, an earthquake over here, and hundreds of people died. Gee, aren't I a selfish bastard because I feel bad about my own stuff? No, that's not helpful. That's not what comparison is for. 
so if it's not naturally helpful, move on to, to something else. All right, let's look at the E. Let's look at the E. That's an interesting phrase that I didn't think I'd be saying. Okay, or never thought of. E for emotions. Okay, here's what we're going to do. There's an old saying in DBT that says that feelings love themselves. And because they love themselves, feelings will always try to survive. They will always try to keep themselves around. The way that this plays out is that if you are sad, you're probably going to want to do things that are sad in nature. Uh, for example, a common symptom of depression is isolating socially, where I just don't go out and I just don't talk to people. Uh, that's probably going to perpetuate being sad, for example. And so there is a part of DBT that is called opposite emotion or seeking after the emotional response that I am not having right now. And that's what the E in accepts stands for is emotion. The idea behind this skill is, this part of the skill, is to do something that will give me a different emotional reaction. So if I can identify uh, how, my, how I'm feeling and I can identify what it's making me want to do, if I'm sad and I want to isolate and I don't want to be around people, or if I'm in a state of great anxiety and I want to go out and just try to solve all my problems all at once, I need to do kind of the opposite of that. The, the cheaty little cheat, cheat technique to remember is to just try to do the opposite. Um, for example, if I want to isolate, I'm going to force myself to go spend some time with people. I had a client years ago who did this, that uh, she tended to isolate when she was depressed and uh, she lived with a number of people. And so one of the things that she did is she didn't force herself to go out and super interact and be a social butterfly or anything. But what she would do is she would go and just do something in an area where other people were sitting. Maybe they're watching TV and she was drawing, or maybe they were drawing and she was watching TV. I don't remember those kinds of details. Um, so she'd go and she'd just sit somewhere where there were people because that was not isolating. And what happened was it, it didn't magically make her feel fantastic, but what it did was it did not perpetuate the sadness. It led to a different emotional reaction, which was kind of like, oh, I'm not alone. All right. Okay which was different than a raising sense of distress and isolation and hopelessness. And it was able to mitigate and tolerate that distress. Remember, distress tolerance, not distress happy times, good fun zone. Not necessary for it to be that dramatic. It just needs to help us survive and tolerate the distress time. And that's kind of what emotion. So like I said, there's the opposite emotion approach. But there's also, if you want to get clever about it, which I hope that you do, you can actually ask yourself, well, what could I do that would give me an emotional reaction? Sometimes it's a positive or pleasant emotion, like I'm going to watch something funny that'll make me laugh, or I'm going to listen to a comedian that'll make me laugh, or something like that. By the way, I, I actually somebody turned me on to this, one of the uh, my clients told me that if you enter a name of a comedian you like into Pandora, it'll pull up comedy routine after comedy routine of similar types of comedians uh, and other things like that. Laughter, joy, that kind of joy response is what oftentimes people go after when they try to create an emotional experience. Although I've seen it being just as effective when we pick less pleasant emotions. Uh, I worked with someone once again years ago who would purposefully, who would put together uh, some little playlists on their iPods. This must have been a few years ago. But you can do the same on your phone or whatever devices you're using to, to play music. The, the playlist were songs that made this person sad and would actually make them cry. And when they were feeling depressed or down, they'd put on this playlist and they'd get emotional and they'd have a good cry and they noticed that they felt better afterwards. And so they really embraced the emotion that they were feeling in a way that allowed them to move on. So again, that technique won't work for everyone, but I just thought I'd share it with you because I thought it was cool. Sharing this document again should show you the P. Now I have time to show you the P. That's not what maybe some websites might mean. In this case, showing you the P is showing you uh, uh, pushing away. The P in accepts stands for pushing away. Pushing away is, well, it's a little bit different. It is a direct distraction attempt. If you are pushing away from a feeling or an event, you are like literally just trying to not focus on it, just trying to distract yourself or get away from it. Think of pushing, I'll 
do this the rest of the pod or the rest of the broadcast here no pushing away from something literally you can do this physically get up and go now I'm not gonna leave but you just get up and go to a different situation you can do it mentally uh, there's such a thing as what they call censoring your rumination or thought stopping is the less I don't know whatever if we call it censoring your rumination we can charge more for it I think is is why we do that but it's basically thought stopping picture a stop sign in your head and when you have the thought of what you're worried about say stop and you say it out loud stop stop just don't stop I'm not gonna do this I'm not gonna do this right now trying to push it away actively so that's that's what that is there's all kinds of uh, visual imagery you can use in your head for this you can picture putting the thoughts in the in a trash can you can picture putting them on a shelf putting them in a box putting them in a cannon and firing them into the ocean <laughs> I, I just made that one up but if you use that one please put it in the comments because I'd love to know that you did even if you didn't put it in the comments anyway and lie to me he is for thoughts T is for thoughts. That's good enough for me. I think was not a song on Sesame Street. So thoughts, yeah, basically similar to some of the others of trying to create a different experience emotionally by using your thoughts. You can simply go with distraction by counting to 10 or trying to think of a different thing, focusing on a different thing on purpose. You can uh, also try to just think of something that is completely removed and different. Uh, one of the things I always encourage people to do when they're brainstorming of any kind, whether you're trying to problem solve or just trying to distract yourself, is don't be afraid to get silly. Uh, many of us have this experience, uh, I know I do, where you know my brain's doing all these different things at once, and if I indulge it, it will go into this tangent, and that tangent, and that tangent, and that tangent, and this tangent, and this tangent, and then all of a sudden I'm somewhere completely different thinking about what would it be like if uh, Bert and Ernie were ninjas and they had a movie where they were on the moon? I don't know why I got there, but uh, probably because I said Sesame Street earlier. And I'm broadcasting from the moon. So there you go. That's why I got there. That makes sense now. So anyway, having thoughts that are just as silly as possible. Um, I'll give you, you know, a very a kind of personal example. My daughter uh, sometimes gets nervous when she's going to bed at night. And so she will actually think about pleasant things. She'll make up little stories sometimes in her mind about her and our dog having an adventure, or she'll think about going to Disneyland or something like that. And so those are just some, some things. You can purposefully think of other things and put a lot of effort into it, uh, because it may take a lot of effort when you're suffering from distress. The S is, in fact, the last letter in accepts. That's a stall that I'm doing while I bring this back up so I can type it. Sensations. We're going to get more heavy into that one uh, uh, next week. But you can use sensations to actually distract yourself away from distress. Uh, sensations would refer to anything that you are feeling. And, and this might be a, a difference here between when we talk about uh, uh, feelings, we're talking about sensory experiences. How do you know that it's hot or cold outside? Well, unless you're looking at a thermometer, uh, or uh, no, not a thermometer. That's for human bodies. Anyway, whatever that thing is you hang up outside <laughs> that tells you uh, how hot it is outside. Barometer, whatever. I guess it's also called a thermometer. So if you go out, if you don't look at that, or you don't look at your phone with the app on it that tells you the temperature, you walk outside and you feel it. You feel it through your skin and just the feeling of warmth or cold. And you feel pretty quickly if what you've put on is appropriate for the day or not. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about sensations, sensory experiences. Sometimes we don't take advantage of the fact that we are carrying around with us a great wealth of sensory input information all the time. And uh, this can be you know, useful if we have something like a, like a stress ball of some kind that we can squeeze and you can focus your attention as much as possible on feeling that you know or you can use other things like sound or you know listen to that little bell or the melodious strains of my voice or whatever it is uh, sound and sight and things like that there's actually a whole dbt section uh, that we're going to be it's actually the skill that we'll be focused on next which will be the use use of our the use of our five senses to help us to distress tolerate yeah, don't think too hard about how I phrase that. 
So that's the last one of accepts. Accepts, as we said before, is an acronym, of course. And if I didn't make it clear before, let me make it clear now. These are not meant to be a one-size-fits-all for everybody and for every situation. These are things that you can run through if you find yourself in trouble emotionally. So you can look at it like this. Activities. Contributing. Comparison. Emotions. As in creating an emotional experience on purpose. Pushing away negative situations or thoughts. Eh. Engaging in purposeful thought thinking, thought thinking. And the use of, of a sensation to distract yourself away from that. You can see how there's so many things right here in this one skill that they don't just even fit easily on this document that I'm using to show you what they are. So activities, contributing, comparisoning, emotions, thing, pushing away thoughts, pushing away thoughts and sensations is what accepts stands for. And I think we've talked a little bit about how you use it. So go ahead and try that when you find yourself uh, overwhelmed with emotion or when you are full of distress and see if that's helpful. Uh, some of the things in there might be more helpful than others. In fact, I can almost guarantee that they will be more helpful for some people than for others in different sections. I uh, would love to hear any feedback that you have about this. As always, we're going to be coming at you about once a week with these uh, skill workshops as we go through each of the 19 uh, DBT survival and emotional regulation and distress tolerance, etc. skills. It's meant to be something, once again, to help supplement your own therapy and your own growth as a person. If you're interested in learning more about the project, go to the website that I mentioned earlier, which is my website, dwighthurst.com slash groups. Dwighthurst.com, and then add a slash groups on it. And what uh, you're going to find is that that'll give a description. It'll usually have the, if I remember to update it, the video that is current. And there's also a, a link there that you can click on if you would like to support this project. As I said before, this is a free thing that I'm doing uh, for everybody out there who can benefit from it. Uh, if you would like to support this project, there's a couple of perks to that. You can donate whatever you feel that the project's worth. Uh, that goes to a link where you can uh, donate any amount you want in increments of $5. Uh, and if you do that, you get a couple things from it. You get free access to any handouts that I would be providing. Uh, you get most of those are also available on the website for purchase. Uh, the DBT diary card, for example, of how you track your progress and your own growth in controlling and regulating your feelings and emotions, that's available on the website as well in the store section. Or if you want to donate to the video project, you get that for free. I'll just email it to you. Uh, you also would be included for two months on an email list serve, which means that you have the ability to email questions, comments, uh, things like that, concerns about the skills experiences with the skills and that will be forwarded to everybody else on the email list and then they can interact and, and share tips back and forth. I also jump on there and, and give tips as well. So that's uh, at the website dwighthurst.com slash groups. You can also email me at dwighthurst at gmail.com if you have any questions or feedback, love to hear from you. Uh, the group, the skills workshops are of course brought to you by my practice at Innovate Mental Health Solutions and by the Broken Brain Podcast, which is my weekly dose of mental health over iTunes and other podcast venues. We'll be back at you next week. Again, we're going to be looking at the use of our five senses to help us to tolerate distress. Thanks much, Lee. Have a wonderful day.